The last day of the state's case in chief started with Special Agent Rodney Pevito, an arson investigator with the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Well, I encountered numerous items that I suspected were bone fragmentation. I also recovered something that I, I believed was part of a tooth and then a, a couple other items that were um, a darkened mass, oh, roughly the size, let's say like a golf ball, maybe a little bit larger, that uh, I felt was a charred muscle tissue. Then the state called Michael Riddle, a fingerprint analyst with the state crime lab who didn't find any of Stephen Avery's prints on or in Teresa Halbach's car. You indicated you had eight latent prints from the Toyota itself. That's correct. That were suitable for analysis. Were any identifications effected? No. The defense hammered this point on cross-examination. But am I correct that you did not and have not, as of today, ever compared fingerprint standards from Lieutenant James Link or Sergeant Andrew Colburn to any of those fingerprints from the RAV4? No, I did not. I'm correct that you did not, right? I did not. You're right. And still have not. Next on the witness list was Tony Zimmerman, a network engineer with Singular Wireless, who ironically testified by phone. To complement his testimony, the state recalled Teresa Halbach's brother Mike. Mike, when you called your sister's um, voicemail on the 3rd of November, uh, do you recall what message you first got? Now, I, I don't want to talk about the messages that, that were retrieved, but the automated message. you remember what, what that said? Uh, it told me how many new voicemail messages there were. Do you have a recollection of how many there were? I know that there were 18. Did you listen to all of them? I believe that I, I did. What was important to me was I knew that the first new voicemail message was from um, Monday afternoon sometime. So after hearing that, I was, you know, extremely worried just because she checks her voicemail uh, you know a number of times every day she, you know she cares with it her cell phone with her all the time. The state's final witness was Calumet County Sheriff's investigator Mark Wiegert. On November 3rd our department had received a call from the Halbach family um, indicating that they had some concerns about their daughter and um, that she possibly was missing they did not know where she was um, I did not take the original call. One of our road deputies did it and then contacted me. Were you um, in charge of or what's known as the lead investigator in that missing persons investigation? Yes. Once Investigator Wiegert was excused from the stand, Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz told the court. Uh, Your Honor, uh, subject to the state offering and the court ruling on uh, exhibits uh, which uh, believe or which the state believes uh, will be appropriately part of the record in the state's uh, case in chief. At this time, the state intends to rest. Afterwards, in a press conference, Kratz had some stronger words for the defense's theory that Manitowoc County Sheriff's officers planted evidence. With nothing, that is with not one shred, at least anything that I've seen, that approaches evidence. Uh, I think is absolutely deplorable. And in the defense's press conference, Jerome Buting said, We do not think that they have presented a strong case, obviously. They disagree, I'm quite sure. But we think that you know, after a month of testimony, there are a number of very, very, very serious questions that remain unanswered. Thursday morning will be spent arguing evidentiary matters outside the presence of the jury, and the defense will begin presenting its case Thursday afternoon. Recapping day 18 of the Stephen Avery trial, Dan o the defense began its first full day of presenting evidence by calling Janine Arvizu, an independent laboratory quality auditor. She reviewed the work of FBI chemist Mark LeBeau, who earlier testified that his EDTA testing proved that Stephen Avery's blood couldn't have been planted in Teresa Halbach's car. But Arvizu disagreed with his findings. Just because EDTA is not detected by the laboratory doesn't mean that that, that blood sample came from somebody actively bleeding onto that spot. On cross-examination, the state questioned her experience with the techniques and technology used in EDTA testing. You yourself have not performed analysis on chemicals using the LCMSMS technique. That's correct. The defense's next witness was Dr. Scott Fairgreave, a forensic anthropologist who testified that it was possible bone fragments found in burn areas on the Avery property were actually burned elsewhere. Can you say you agree that 
human remains were moved here, are you talking about moved a little bit within one site or moved from point A to point B or, or both? Given that there are three locations, from my understanding, where we have bone uh, having been documented to have come from, then we are talking about point A to B or to C, as the case may be. But on cross-examination, the state attacked his credential. Are you familiar with a um, process called board certification? Yes, I am. And um, what is that? It's uh, board certification for forensic anthropologists is uh, the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. And you have not yet pursued that certification, is that mm, right? That is correct. The defense then recalled Calumet County Sheriff Investigator Mark Wieger to conclude the fourth week of testimony. He clarified statements made by a school bus driver who claimed to have seen a woman taking pictures on the Avery property the day Teresa Halbach disappeared. Before excusing the jury for the weekend, Judge Patrick Willis told them, As you know, we are getting close to the end of this trial. It is important for the court to know that each of you has been able to comply with the court's restrictions on outside information about this case. Recapping day 20 of the Stephen Avery trial. Day 21 of the Stephen Avery trial didn't feature any testimony from Stephen Avery's defense, but it did see some of the most significant developments thus far, starting with Judge Patrick Willis dismissing the false imprisonment charge against Avery. The state does offer a plausible scenario for what happened. However, that's not the standard that the court must apply. The evidence has to be sufficient to support a jury verdict of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The circumstantial evidence introduced by the state is, if believed by the jury, sufficient to sustain a guilty verdict on the other charges, but the court believes there's minimal evidence supporting the false imprisonment charge. Viewed most favorable to the state, there's a logical inference that the victim entered the defendant's trailer for some unspecified period of time and that she was killed by the defendant in his garage. There's no evidence from which a jury can determine the circumstances of how she went from the trailer to the garage. To conclude on the evidence presented that she was forced there against her will would require speculation on the part of the jury. Avery still faces charges of first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. Judge Willis also denied motions to suppress DNA evidence from a bullet fragment as well as evidence seized from Stephen Avery's property in the days after Halbach disappeared. First, as the court noted, the search was commenced within the five-day time limit. Second, law enforcement personnel had a very large area to search under the warrant, that is the entire Avery Auto salvage yard, and they did not artificially delay in any way their search of the, of the burn pit. Uh, third and most significant, the significance of the burn pit site was not apparent until what appeared to be human remains were discovered there. Once that discovery was made, the authorities worked promptly to collect the evidence. There was nothing unreasonable about the search of the burn, burn pit. For these reasons, the defense renewed motion to suppress evidence based on unlawful searches is likewise denied. After those rulings, Judge Willis conducted individual voir dire and asked each juror whether he or she has been able to comply with the court's order forbidding the jury from consuming any news accounts of the trial or talking about it with others. There were issues with two of the jurors, as Andy Nellison of the Green Bay Press Gazette, a media representative in that voir dire process, explains. This juror initially said that they had no contact with the media and no contact with other people, said that their spouse had talked to them about the case that the spouse claimed to know more about what's going on than the juror did and that on Saturday had said something along the lines something to the effect that it wouldn't make any difference what the jurors decide because this case is going to appeals anyway. Same juror mentioning comments from their spouse said that things they say go in one ear and out the other and it doesn't register in between. Judge Willis declined to immediately rule on whether to strike those two jurors for cause. He instead turned his attention to whether Stephen Avery would testify in his own defense and outside the jury's presence the court heard from Avery for the first time. Mr. Avery, uh, do you understand that you have a constitutional right to testify in this case if you wish? Yes, I do. And do you further understand that you have a constitutional right not to testify if you wish? Yes, I do. 
Do you understand that the decision uh, whether to testify or not is yours to make? Yes. That means uh, you can listen to your attorneys and, and listen to their advice, but ultimately it's your call. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Has anyone uh, made any threats or promises to you to influence your decision? No, they didn't. Have you uh, thoroughly discussed your decision uh, with your attorneys? Yes, I did. And have you made a decision as to whether or not you wish to testify in this case? Yes. What is your decision? The decision is I'm an innocent man, and I, there's no reason for me to testify. That everybody knows I'm innocent. Okay. So you wish not to testify, is that correct? Yes. The jury was then brought back in and... Uh, Mr. Strang, at this time, uh, the defense may call its next witness. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Budin and I jointly have elected to rest uh, at this time on behalf of uh, Stephen Avery. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Kratz, does the uh, state have any witnesses or testimony to offer in rebuttal? We do not, Your Honor. All right, members of the jury, that concludes the evidence portion uh, of this trial. The jury will have the day off Tuesday and hear closing arguments on Wednesday after Monday's proceedings. Teresa Halbach's brother Mike talked about hearing Stephen Avery profess his innocence. He, he likes to talk, so I, I think he probably would have liked to be up on the stand, but um, it was kind of counterintuitive. Uh, if he's innocent, he should go up on the stand and say, you know, he has nothing to hide, so why, you know, why isn't he up there? But um, everything I've heard him say hasn't been the truth. Uh, no different today. Avery's defense attorneys then discussed the end of their case with reporters. Now, I'm anxious to get to the point where we can do a closing argument, where we can bring it all together, where we can show the jury just, you know, what the problems are with their case. And, you know, obviously they're anxious to try and do the opposite. Um, I think closing arguments in this case, unlike maybe in some cases where by the time you get to closing, it doesn't make a big difference. I think it does in this case. It will, will make a difference in this case. Recapping day 21 of the Stephen Avery trial. They